Hi everyone, my name is Yasna Goshosvi and I'm president of the Iranian Students Foundation at Maryland this year. I'm very excited and honored that our board has had the support to be able to put on this event. On behalf of the board, I'd like to welcome and thank all of you for joining our panel on supporting Black Lives Matter and a special thank you to our panelists, Taron Von Gassri, Priscilla Kunkuhoveda, Mana Harazi, and our moderator, Yasik Zadi. I'm very excited to listen and learn more myself, as I'm sure you all are too. On that note, I'm going to introduce our wonderful moderator, Yasi Badi, and turn the event over to her. Yasi Badi is a student at NYU Law, uh, where she is part of the Middle Eastern Law Students Association, Law Students for Justice in Palestine, International Refugee Assistance Project, and the NYU chapter of the National Lawyers Guild. As a lawyer, she hopes to leverage her skills to support movements working to abolish systems of oppression while also representing those who are most impacted by them. Before law school, Yossi lived in Thessaloniki, Greece, where she worked at El Pita refugee camp. After seven months in Greece, Yossi returned stateside to run the Washington DC branch of the PD Green program, where she supported the academic achievement of incarcerated people in the DMV by organizing and training university students to tutor GED students inside prisons and jails. She's also a UMD and ISF alum. Thank you, Yasi, it's all yours now. Thank you, Yasna, for that introduction. And thank you all for making the time to be here tonight for such an important conversation. Um, especially a big thank you to our amazing panelists and a big shout out to ISF for putting in the time to organize this event. Uh, personally, I'm extremely honored and excited and a little bit nervous to be facilitating this conversation between such incredible panelists. Um, we are here tonight because we are collectively witnessing decades of Black liberation organizing against white supremacy result in an extraordinary response to the continued and deeply embedded state violence against Black people in this country. Dr. Angela Davis speculated that the uprisings may be characterized as the largest and most diverse sustained demonstrations in our lifetimes, which give people, including me, a great deal of hope. And while the uprisings bring hope, they cannot be separated from the deep pain and oppression imposed on Black people for centuries by this country. We are here tonight because Black Lives Matter, and we are being called on by Black organizers all across the country to defund the police and invest in communities to dismantle white supremacy. Many of us have attended actions in the streets, listened to panels and webinars, donated to mutual aid funds and read books to try to become more educated. Many of us are wondering what we can do to play our part in the movement. Tonight we'll be talking about the role our own communities play in upholding white supremacy and anti-blackness, how we can most effectively be in solidarity with Black Lives Matter, and how the Iranian American community can and must do better. So in just a second, I'm gonna introduce each of our incredible panelists and they'll have seven minutes each for opening comments to just tell us a little bit more about themselves, the work they're doing and their initial thoughts about the conversation. After that, we'll go through a few questions that will guide the conversation. Um, and at the end, hopefully we'll have time to get through some of the questions many of you have submitted when you registered. Um, if not, we'll try to work it through the conversation already. I think we've done a pretty good job of that. Um, and if anyone has any other questions that come up throughout the talk, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen. Um, so we can go ahead and go to the next slide. So our first panelist today is Priscilla Kunku Hoveda. Priscilla Kunku Hoveda is a human rights lawyer who has a decade of experience working with the United Nations Children's Fund, UNICEF, other UN agencies and non-governmental organizations in the US, France, DR Congo, the Islamic Republic of Mauritania, the Federal Republic of Nigeria, and many others. Her work focuses on building international and national policies for the most vulnerable populations around the world. She has led the release and reintegration of children associated to armed groups forces, incarcerated children, as well as survivors of sexual violence. In her other life, Priscilla, born in France from a Congolese father and an Iranian mother, is a writer and one of the co-founders of the Collective for Black Iranians. She holds dual international law and business degrees, from Sorbonne Law 
and ESSEC Business School and NYU Law. So Priscilla, if you wanna go ahead and take it away from there and then we'll loop back to the other panelists. Thank you so much, Yossi, and thank you to all of you for organizing this panel today and hopefully continuing this tradition of leading important conversations. Um, I would like to add about myself that I'm also the proud mother of three little ones, uh, the eldest being six, Kema, and the two little ones being almost four, Farah and Kailondo. They are all speaking Farsi to the best of their capacity, and I'm really looking forward to taking them there so they can also discover our beautiful country at some point. Um, regarding my work, um, I am indeed a human rights attorney. I've worked in war zones post-conflict, focusing on defending the rights of women and children, children who fight for armed groups, um, and, um, and also women as well as um, working with incarcerated children all over the world, uh, Central African Republic, Democratic Republic of Congo, Mauritania, Nigeria, and so on. I founded with five other Black and Afro-Iranians, the Collective for Black Iranians, and we will be launching very soon, and we're truly looking forward to continuing conversations with everyone in the diaspora and beyond. The focus of the collective will be to ensure that there is is proper representation of Black and Afro-Iranians throughout the Iranian diaspora and that there is a public education and communication material being presented and produced within the Iranian diaspora all over, all over the world, not just in America, hopefully, that takes into account our point of view. But I'm sure we'll have lots of time to discuss this. Thank you. Thank you, Priscilla. Our next panelist, if we could share the slides again. Wonderful. Our next panelist is Tehran Von Gasri. Tehran Von Gasri is one of the hottest rising comedians on the Hollywood comedy scene, with a diverse contrasting background of black and Persian, Muslim and Jewish, and street smarts and academia. Tehran brings a fresh, unique perspective to comedy and humor. Tehran's comedy style has been compared to a blend of Dave Chappelle meets Maz Dobrani. As seen on Comedy Central, HBO, and Fox, find Tehran at his Laugh, Laugh Factory residency every Monday and Thursday at 9.45 p.m. on his podcast, Imperfect Gentleman, or social media. And his handle for socials is at the bottom. I am Tehran. Take it away, Tehran. So I know why you try to say laugh because everybody else on this panel is so esteemed. You thought mine was gonna be something a little more high class. Uh, we listen to Priscilla. I know Priscilla very well. She's one of my very close friends. She is this acclaimed human rights attorney. She's worked with the United Nations. And then I just met Yasi, and Yasi's the chairman of everything. And she spent all her time. Like when I went to Greece, I went to an island to party. She went to a refugee camp in Greece. So. Basically, right now, you guys are all overachievers. Mana's going to come in next, and Mana's going to be a super overachiever. Uh, all I can say for me is that as far as I go, I've always been a bridge between the Black community and the Iranian community, the American community, and the international community. And that's it. And I do it in my own way of doing things. So I appreciate you guys for having me on this esteemed panel. Sure, I went to school, and I have a lot of academic education. But as far as this conversation, I have a lot of life experience and knowledge from firsthand, uh, firsthand observations that I can give. And uh, that's about it. Thanks, Tehran. And thank you for your compliments. I wasn't expecting that. Appreciate it. Um, next up, we have Mana Kharazi. Mana Kharazi is a community leader and organizer with over 10 years of experience in racial justice identity-based and youth leadership movement work. Mana currently serves as the Rapid Response Campaign Director for Move On and as the director of the No War Campaign. Mana is the former executive director of EOB, an organization that strengthens the Iranian diaspora and empowers youth. Mana led EOB during its legal battle, EOB v. Trump, the first lawsuit against Muslim ban 3.0, blocking the ban and winning in the Fourth Circuit. Mana was a field organizer at Amnesty International USA, leading in Alabama, Tennessee, and the Carolinas. 
Mana was also educational director of a Greek refugee organization, co-developing the first comprehensive educational refugee youth program. Mana and her work have appeared on BBC, CNN, Frontline, and Huffington Post. She has also written for The Guardian and The Washington Post. It's all you, Mana. Hey, thanks. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. I'm very clear on the fact that I am not Black Iranian, uh, and so I'm hoping that my role in this will be to model what it will look like to be a good co-conspirator and ally and someone that uplifts voices and doesn't take up space. So on that note, I'm going to go ahead and mute now. Love it. Thank you for modeling, Mana. Um, so want to get straight to some of the questions that hopefully will guide our conversation a little bit more. Um, so the first question that I think will be really important to address to our attendees tonight is how does the Iranian community manifest and perpetuate anti-blackness? How do non-black Iranians benefit from the fights and struggles of black Iranians and black people in general? And in no specific order, whoever kind of wants to take the floor first, uh, go for it. I nominate Priscilla. Thanks. you Tehran really <laughs> no I think I mean I really liked what Tehran was saying earlier when he mentioned that he has first-hand experience of being black and Iranian and that's degrees and I'll list them law school masters in economy but I think the most important point here is that our experience is our expertise and that you can have as many PhD and doctorates on the issue but being or on the theme and topic of being black on a certain identity but you need a, the dialogue with people who have that experience because that's truly also where the expertise lies so, so the question is a huge one how does the Iranian American um, community contributes or doesn't um, to this environment that um, is anti-black often and I really would like to start by maybe sharing a little bit about my own experience of being black Iranian, of being African Iranian, Congolese Iranian, growing up in Tehran, and then also living in France, living in Congo, and living in the US, so in different Iranian diasporas as well, for a significant amount of time. And, you know, the commonality in all these experiences is definitely the warmth of our people and, you know, the beauty of our culture. I don't think we need to preface everything before we get into the heart of the subject. Um, and I also believe it's extremely important that we all feel a little uncomfortable at some point in the conversation if we actually want to ensure that we're addressing the topics that we claim to be addressing. But I learned that I was a black child in Iran, in the streets of Tehran. Um, it's not a conversation I've had before with my white passing mother who identified strongly brown but who is um, you know can pass for any white um, woman truly uh, being from the northern part of Iran Tehran and Isfahan and having been raised by her and that part of my family in Tehran and traveling to Isfahan and Karaj for the summers going to school and just being like any other Iranian kid in Tehran except that I wasn't I was black and I learned it there. So to begin with, I think as a community, the first point is to admit that we do see race. And instead of hiding behind the fact that everything is different in Iran and everything is different in our community, we do not see color, I believe is an argument that has been used by many other communities, not just the Iranian community, before they realized or not that actually they did see race because race is a social construct and we all live in societies society that you know knows of the construct of race um, and I believe that if there was indeed a better education as to the connections and how did that happen um, such as the historical connection between East Africa and Persia with the Persian Gulf slave trade or the Indian Ocean slave trade in the 19th century and the movement of East Africans being trafficked and slaved by Persian, uh, by, by also by Persian slaveholders and Persian merchants who would purchase 
um, East African slaves, enslaved people, and dock in the different ports of the Persian Gulf, from Bandar Abbas to Boucher to, to um, Ban there's so many different Bandar in that coastal region. And unfortunately, it's a part of history that is not well known, if at all known, in the Iranian diaspora and the Iranian community at large. And it's a history that I've myself, myself learned quite late in my journey because there was no conversation about being black except from the usual insiodidi and so forth, there is no conversations apart from these interactions of different cities of, of Iran, not just Tehran, the city, not the panelist. This is going to be very confusing. Every time we mention Tehran, someone will think I'm actually talking about, after all, we'll have to say City. Can we agree? I will, I will just re refer to the city as Tehran City so that there is no confusion. But, um, you know, this, uh, this erasure of, of being black is, is, is actually everywhere in the diaspora, not just in Iran. It's in the Iranian-American diaspora, it's in the Iranian-French diaspora. Those are the diasporas I can speak because I've experienced them and I would, it would be I think it's very beneficial to be also able to reflect on the different experiences we've had and have conversations about it. And when we look at, you know, the great well-intentioned Iranian Americans who say POC and push for the identification of POC, of Brown, um, I believe that there should be an effort in taking into consideration that in this equation, there are also black and Afro-Iranians. And by black and afro -Iranians, I want to be clear that by black Iranians, it's definitely all Iranians. Afro-Iranian was the term dubbed by a scholar, a non-black, non-Afro-Iranian scholar from Canada. Populations in the southern part of Iran who are direct descendants of um, former African enslaved people. So as much as we've seen an times most definitely an opportunity for many to research and discuss the fate or the past in Iran, what we haven't seen is a real conversation of what it means to be Black within our community. Um, these scholars who have dis discussed um, or researched or made documentaries on Afro-Iranian communities have for most never addressed the fact that they are also Black Iranians, but Iranians who are Black because one parent is Nigerian or is, you know, African-American or is Congolese, it's irrelevant. The one parent is Black and the other one is not Black, but Iranian and who ran you know you you don't have to be born in LA to be issue it to be the, the the product of a multicultural marriage you can be living in Iran and be Nigerian Iranian and be born in Iran raised in Iran have only experienced Iran have never maybe you've been to Turkey and Dubai but you truly identify Iranian and you are also Nigerian and you are black and when it comes to that conversation what is very very interesting is that it's also complete, it's, it's completely ignored. It's as if in Iran, we could only be black if we're Afro-Iranians, and that's already progressed because before, and, and still for many, uh, we are not even aware that we have Just in the fact that now there are conversations about these communities, but what's still lacking is conversations about blackness in Iran. And when the community here in, a, in America, in the Iranian-American diaspora wants You know, as it's in ways that erases black voices, black Iranian voices, Afro-Iranian voices, because it presupposes that we're not here. So why don't we all gather and talk about people who are not here and decide how it is for them to be who they are. 
And as much as it sounds absurd, it's what's happening in our community. And it's what's been happening for the 38 years, minus maybe the seven years of my childhood, because I don't remember, but you know, has been happening for the longest time is just this constant um, erasure of blackness in our, in our community, whether we are white, We, we have had, you know, narratives, books written discussing the Iranian American identity and not once, because I read it from the first page until the last, mentioning black Iranians, Afro-Iranians. For me to read something like this, it makes me wonder, well, but where am I on this map? Where am I? So here we are discussing, we should identify brown, we should identify POC. Well, guess what? I'm a black woman. I'm a black Iranian woman. But when I read narratives, books, or articles written about the Iranian American identity formation, there is never the mention of the fact that identity not foreign to the Iranian identity. And I think that's the biggest point I want to make tonight or this afternoon in California time is that blackness is not foreign. The Iranian consciousness to the Iranian identity. It has been there. It has been there for the longest time, since at least the 18th, 19th century. And we do have, thankfully, responsible scholars, objective and neutral and independent, such as Bito Barulizade, who's wrote a thesis called Seeing Race, that I really invite you know, students and, and, and other listeners to, to take the time to read the 250 because it will enlighten you a lot on the history of the Persian Gulf slave trade and actually the connections between Africa and Iran and the fact that, the, the, that blackness has never been foreign to our identity and has always been a part of it. Iranians didn't need to wait um, to have multicultural marriages to see black Iranians or, or, or for us to be be a part of that community. We have been a part of that community. Afro-Iranians have been a part of that community for longer than we have been alive. And the fact that we're holding or having conversations or writing books and, 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 and discussing identity formation in, in America, in the Iranian-American diaspora, and ignoring that blackness is a part of it is one of the harms that, 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 that is being done. And, and, is that is a disservice to the Iranian diaspora, the Iranian community, and the black community, not just in America, but at large. I hope I, I answered. I know you, I answered something. You actually answered every question anyone could ever have. So you technically just answered every oh, question. Oh, Tom, you you possibly, you I'm just saying. I so I can Syria. log off? No, or Can never, I log off? Never, can I log off? We can't have this conversation. <laughs> We can't have this conversation without you. I, I, Priscilla and I, uh, besides having a good friendship, uh, we also have a number of these, these uh, conferences that we talk, even amongst ourselves. And she always gives the academic point of view. And then possibly I come in with just a taste of realism. We come from different backgrounds. So, and, and it's important, Priscilla has said many things. First of all, she was expressing the understanding of experience and observation and the relative importance of it in accordance with, if not more so than academic observation. However, academic observation is extremely important because just because you've experienced something or not experienced something doesn't mean that it exists or doesn't exist. The interesting thing about the truth, the most interesting thing about the truth is that the truth needs no belief. It does not need your opinion or your feelings. So there is an academic aspect that we often neglect, and we've seen Iranians do this so much when we, when we talk about politics and the revolution, I, I engage often in, in political discussions where I simply listen because I talk about principles and not politics, and Iranians tell me how things are and how they were in Iran, but they really just give their experience. They've actually never read a book or educated themselves on all the dynamics involved. They just remember the time that they were in college and 
there were guns pointed the, at them by the Shah's men. And then they remember the time where these guys with these beards took over and they were just bad. They don't understand the actual dynamics. And this is why academics is very important. However, you cannot have academics without a firsthand personal experience observation. And that's what Priscilla is talking about, is that discord where Iranians often either discount the person, the, the person of color narrative in Iran, or they have this conversation without a person of color from Iran in the conversation. Here's the thing, they're not mutually exclusive, right? But Priscilla and I, Priscilla and I have two very different backgrounds. How so? Because I was born in the United States and I'm a product of an Iranian man who had a child and married a black American woman. And it's very different because when I have these conversations, people from Iran will be like, you know, we have the Bandari people in Iran too, they're black. And I'm like, yeah, they are actually just Iranian. They are culturally and nationally Iranian. It's a very different dynamic, right? Uh, they'll send me videos, Iranians will send me videos of like, uh, and I love, I love Iranians. They send me these videos of like any black person who speaks Farsi, I will get this video no matter what, every single time. Doesn't matter who the black person is. It could be MC Hammer and I will get the video. If 50 Cent says, Bale, I get the video. So recently with, um, there are Afro-Iranians from Iran who are speaking Farsi and they're sending me this video. I'm like, yes, they should speak Farsi. They should speak Farsi. They're from Iran. They were born and raised in Iran. The fact that you are shocked that they speak Farsi is part of the problem. That is actually part of the problem. The fact that you're actually shocked, the fact that there's only one Tehran, right? Where everyone's like, oh, do you know Tehran? He's black and Iranian. Well, one time a person asked me like, oh, um, was like, oh yeah, because you're like the only black and Iranian. That's part of the problem. That's where the narrative gets exploited and centered in America. The diaspora continues the racism and the division. Why? Because the biggest lie Iranians ever told themselves is, we are white. Iranians love to say, we are white, and I'm there. I'm like, no, you're next. And that's what people need to understand. When Iranians don't understand racism, I break it down in terms that families can simply understand, even if they're a bit vulgar for Iranians. Uh, the same way Iranians be like, Iranians aren't racist. And I'm like, yes, they are. The fact that there's only one or a few of me is a sign of that. The fact that if your daughter brings home a white guy named Eric, you're fine with it. But if she brings home a black guy named Jamal, she's a whore. That's a conversation that we need to have. We need to have these conversations. Haji Firuz is a conversation we need to have. Iranians can no longer afford to discount, dismiss, or remove themselves from race conversations in the United States by simply saying, this does not concern us. But it does, because your children are, are becoming engaged and involved with people who are uh, of color, whether they're Latinx or they are African American or so on. More importantly, you are seen as a person of color in the United States, especially within within reason, even if you can pass. And, and thirdly, the most important thing is that the immigrants of the United States have benefited greatly from black civil rights in this country, whether it's from the 13th Amendment, which is why we receive citizenship, or from Loving, which is why they can marry that blonde girl that they meet in college for their green card. All of these things are, are benefits that Iranians as immigrants have received from black civil rights struggle. So black civil rights is simply the front line, but it's not the end of the line. And when people say things like black lives matter, they also mean LGBTQ lives matter. They also mean Latinx lives matter. They also mean immigrant lives matter. And ultimately they also mean Iranian lives matter. I sometimes find myself in this epicenter of conversation where it's like, but what about what's going on in Iran? I understand that is also a problem. The thing about struggle is that it's not mutually exclusive. And the thing about civil rights is that it's not a civil, it's not a zero sum game. It's not I win if you lose. I can only win if you lose. This is not how civil rights works. It's if I win, we all win. And so if we think about it as inclusivity, if we think about it in the position of white, 
white whiteness, for example, whiteness and white people, if they start thinking of white supreme, supremacy as a white problem to deal with instead of a black issue to empathize with, you will see the value in civil rights all across the board. Are you snapping for me, Mana? Are you snapping? Yeah, I'm sorry. I come from like a youth organizing and there's some of, some of my folks are on this call. We, we snap when we really like something. <laughs> I appreciate that. But it is an important conversation for us to have. Yasi, I believe you asked two questions back to back, both of which were extremely expansive. What is the second question that you asked? You definitely answered it. The, the first one was, how does the Iranian community manifest and perpetuate anti-Blackness? And the second was, how do non-Black Iranians benefit from the fights and struggles of Black Iranians and Black people in general? And I think your point about civil rights not being a zero-sum game is extremely relevant and on point to that question, especially in this country. And definitely when it comes to perpetuating, let's realize that Number one, Iranians love to say we are white, right? My dad, even my dad, I, I had to, I couldn't even, I had to tell my dad I was black when I was like 15. I had to come out of the closet. I had to explain it to him like, Bubba, um, <laughs> I'm black. Like I had to express it to him. So the concept is uh, awareness. Awareness is something that's extremely vital. Secondly, we have to have the conversation where not only are we not right, white, but Iranians are also at times, for all the amazing things that the Iranian culture presents itself, are also racist. And one of those manifestations of racism comes from a term, Khadiji Paras, where we prefer that which is foreign, but specifically that which is Western. They find themselves, Iranians came to America, and when they lied, they said they were Italian. They didn't say they were Congolese. Why? Because they found value in whiteness. They found value in changing their names from Farhad to Frank. And that is something that needs to be addressed. And thirdly, it needs to be addressed how we have systemic racism, not only in our culture, but in our language. Let's be real. We've been calling Asians Chesh Tang until yesterday. Like, Chesh Tang just means tie dyes. Probably not the nicest thing to call an entire group of people who are anything but. So if we're aware of it, if we're aware of the backgrounds, and, and here's, the, here's the best part. It's just reflection, right? Look at yourselves in the mirror. But mirrors, mirrors are not just meant for reflection. Here's the best part about mirrors. They're actually also meant for correction. So when you look at yourself in the mirror and you see that your collar's crooked or your shirt's untucked or you have a smudge on your face, you straighten your collar, you pull down your shirt, you remove that smudge. We can correct these mistakes. We now know that even though Haji Firuz has a history of 3,800 years, that now in today's world, it is wrong and we can correct it now. It's never too late. Thank you, straight facts. Um, I think both of you have said so many wonderful nuggets that I've just been jotting down and I want to kind of pull out and amplify two things that will hopefully lead us to looking in the mirror and making some corrections. Um, but Priscilla, you mentioned um, how both in your real life experience and in academic texts that you've read, you've just seen constantly the erasure of black Iranians in our communities. And Tehran, you also kind of echoed this point when you said that oftentimes people will just be completely shocked to hear you speak Farsi. Um, so with those things in mind, I want to ask, how do you all think that the Iranian American community uh, can do better in no longer erasing Black and Afro-Iranians from Iranian consciousness? What can Mana, we do? Mana, we'd love to hear what you have to think. Yeah, no, thanks. Uh, I actually, I don't want to go first, though. Like, I'm super mindful of the fact that I'm actually not Black Iranian. Um, yeah, don't worry. We noticed. We noticed. Even though that, the, that hair, that hair, we could, okay, please. We'd love to hear what you have to say. Yeah, um, I mean, I think, so I've had the interesting role of organizing within the Iranian American community for years. And anytime I tell someone that, especially if they're Iranian, like the first thing they say is, how were you able to tolerate doing that for so long? Um, I think it's important to like acknowledge that 
uh, anti-blackness it permeates throughout our culture throughout our history um, and that it's important for us to acknowledge that though we um, haven't been with this country for centuries and so there's an entire history of systemic racism and institutional racism that we are not a part of that once we came in and i think one of the questions someone wrote down to is like there's um there's an idea of success within the Iranian American community, within the Iranian diaspora in particular, that's like super focused on materialism and wealth and all sorts of like superficial markers of success that excludes so many folks. And when we also talk about this and we acknowledge that there's a level of anti-blackness, the fact that like in our language, the only time we qualify someone's race is when they're like not part of the majority right, is part of the problem. So like I, uh, as someone who's been organizing within the community, have been trying for many years to be really mindful of that because I've been part of youth spaces where we are multiracial and we have folks from all over the spectrum. We have some of the folks who have like the least amount of money and we have folks that are extremely wealthy. We have folks that uh, young people that are multiracial that identify as black and we have folks that are very white passing and only have to admit that they're Iranian when they want to in certain spaces. Um, and I think that the ways that we can step up first is like one, this is the first place that I'm seeing where um, from the very beginning and not as like a correction, but from the very beginning of organizing this panel, it was about having black voices lead and black Iranian voices lead. Um, I think when we do talk about for those of us who are non-Black Iranians, like we have to make sure that our language isn't qualifying to make sure the assumption isn't that Iranians are not Black, that they're white passing, and that anyone that's outside of that is an outlier, that when we are posting, and I think um, there's a part of our community that is super anti-Black, and we have prioritized their learning, their comfort, Taro um, and will see with them more than anyone else, and I'm just going to ignore them for the sake of this conversation. I think for folks that are non-Black Iranian who identify as progressive, who believe that they want to be good allies, it's one is like, and also really quickly, a lot of what I'm sharing, I've learned from having a relationship with Priscilla. I've learned from like having conversations with her, learning from her. I've learned also from making mistakes, being checked holding myself accountable, being responsible for that, being okay with being uncomfortable with that, stepping back and then just listening. Um, so one is like, if you're gonna, like none of us need to act like, especially if we're not black Iranian, we don't need to act like we're the best about race. We don't need to be like posting our social media and acting like we're the biggest allies online, right? Um, I don't think any, I think the minute you feel like you're good at something, you risk that, that you risk not being good at anymore. I think that you always have to acknowledge that like you're still learning and you're still growing and be okay with that. And so, for example, um, groups and spaces that post about race and talk about it, but post things that are really triggering that forget that there are black folks that are gonna be looking at that, that the audience, when you're talking about uh, within an Iranian space, that you're only thinking you're talking to like non-black Iranians, that you're only talking to a certain group, you're gonna, ensure that you exclude, that you traumatize, and that you uh, once again reinforce to a group of folks that have been marginalized and excluded in every space that, oh yeah, this conversation, it's not, it might be about you, but it's not with you, it's not for you, we're just going to go do it over here. So I think there's a lot of things like that that we can do better. Um, I think if you as a person are individually there's there's a level of responsibility and ways of doing this better but if you are organizing a space or leading a space you have an obligation to ensure that it is the safest for the people that feel the most excluded that if there is a history of exclusion or erasure within your community and in the iranian community it's it's we have erased black Iranians completely excluded them, uh, those of us who are non-black Iranian, that, that we ensure that it's the safest for those folks. Um, because if it's the safest for those folks, it's gonna be safe for all of us, right? Uh, and there is a record that, that we need to work on. I'm gonna step back though, because I think I, I said enough. Every, everything you said was amazing and fantastic. And just simply, understanding that there is a problem is the first step right so identify the issue here a lot of times iranians and in, in the iranian families we all know what it is right so when you're growing up and you're you're like the worst kid in your class but 
when your parents go to a mehmuni and they're like, oh yeah, my kid, straight A student, going to be a doctor. We've all been there, right? So even when I, when I do the accent, it's because that's the accent that I was raised with. I don't understand my father's been in this country uh, for 30 some years. How he's managed not to speak English is amazing, but the fact that he even learned English is even more amazing because left a country where he, he had everything to come to a country where he had nothing and start from scratch and learn a language that was as foreign to his language as any language possible to the point where they read the entire opposite direction. So I'm always, always incredibly inspired and respectful and in awe of someone being able to do that. The same way that I'm in awe of my father living in this country for 30 some years and somehow like the matrix dodging learning English. It's, it's, it's actually amazing. Like at this point, he goes out of his way and I, I respect it. But what I didn't always like is how sometimes when there was a problem, we would be taught to hide our problems, to keep it secretive, which is why we actually have uh, an increasingly, uh, uh, increasing drug problem in Iranian community whether it's in Washington, D.C. or here where I live now, because I'm from Washington, D.C., in Los Angeles, because people refuse to acknowledge there's a problem. We do the same thing when it comes to race. Identify the issue. Be clear about what that problem is. Secondly, then you go into this concept, well, here is the problem. Then you want to understand everyone's interests. Where is everyone coming from? Do we have a problem? We know that we do. We've heard We've heard the words. I have firsthand experience of, of, of hearing things. It's actually why I went and learned Farsi. People will be like, Ted, oh, your Farsi is so good. I learned so I could know which, what people were saying about me behind my back in front of my face because Iranians can be professionals at that. They'll just be like, eh, eh, in ugly fat girl, let me go on. It's like, yo, ugly fat girl is not even in Farsi, bro. Like, what are we doing right now, right? So they'll say stuff in in Farsi in front of you. So I learned Farsi because I remember growing up and people being like, eh, in siahikie, in okiovorde. Who's this black guy? Who brought him? And then I, I learned Farsi so I could respond. And I'd be like, oh yeah, I'm matmanovorde. Your aunt brought me, right? Like I got good at Farsi. So the whole concept is we should, we should know that there's a problem, understand what everyone's interests are, and then list our own possible solutions, right? So we should all be accountable for our own actions. What do I do that's wrong? Not what does everyone else do that's wrong, but what do I do that's wrong? And when I hear people speaking in this manner, do I speak up, do I speak out, or do I just bite my tongue and give in to Rudawasi Toro, or more importantly, just normalize it and let it go? Do I do that? Do I give in to those concepts that we often have in the family? Then we have to we have to evaluate these options, right? We have to be like, well, what's the best thing to do? I know we could be more inclusive. I know it's difficult for Iranian kids to sometimes stand up to their parents because we've been, we've been taught not to do that, to be extremely obedient. And we are for the most part. I'm sure there's a lot of people on this call that are doctors and lawyers and engineers because that's the path that was given to us. And that's not only is it perfectly fine, it's amazing. But do we need more... TV writers, film writers, entertainers? Sure, of course we do. That's how voices get heard. Do we need more, do we need more production managers or, or singers or soundstage designers? Sure, fashion designers, whatever it is, we need more of. And when it comes to the racist agenda, we need more people to speak up and speak out when they hear it. When you see something, say something. If your friends are using terms like, oh, yeah, this black guy came and then why, why did you have to denote his race? Why couldn't he have just been a guy? Why did he have to be a black guy? Did it add that much value to your story? Call these people out. If your parents are like, oh, because we all know the word deuced means, you know, so we're like, uh, you know, so if, if you hear that, be like, why, why is that an issue? Why is that, a, why is that an issue? What, what does it matter? What if there's uh, the black guy who's a doctor, is it better to date the white guy who's a criminal? Like, let's, let's have these conversations. What, what is it exactly what you're looking for? Because it, at, at the end of the day, sometimes with the Iranians, it's not just racism, it's placism. There's a class system which we've manifested and, and, and embraced and emplaced amongst ourselves, where we have given value to certain individuals and devalued others. That's also part of the bigger umbrella 
of an issue. And these are all things that cannot be solved if we refuse to acknowledge them, refuse to be aware of them, and refuse to discuss them with one another. I mean, you guys have said it all, so I don't know, but what I've been thinking about when Tehran was speaking and Mona and also Yossi, when you, you asked the question and formulated the question, my first reaction was like, but it's already there. Like, there's so many blueprints. It's just honestly into the don't be lazy about it, you know, and maybe in more beautiful terms, not everything that is faced can be changed. And I'm hoping everybody else knows the end of that quote, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. James Baldwin. So check your own privileges, check your own assumptions. We all benefit from some level of privilege. You know, I'm, I, I'm a black woman. I'm maybe in the browner tones, you know, and do you have lighter skin, you have darker skin. I have curly hair, depending on in which society I'm going to be, I will be perceived a certain way or another way. In some societies, I'll be perceived as exotic, as attractive, as, you know, is she from the Caribbean? Or is she from, I don't know, insert another place that's considered exotic by the masses. But what is, what is important is that being aware of, of your own bias. We all have some level of bias. We all do, I do, we all do. And we should all be working hard on, you know, being better at it and, and being able to formulate support and show mobilization in an authentic way that doesn't create additional harm to, to those that we are claiming to represent or to defend or to help, quote unquote. It's been done in so many other communities for the longest times that when I do see allyship that's performative, I can only tell myself that this must be just ego, wanting to be in the forefront, wanting to speak up on an issue so bad to get, to be highlighted, to be in the front line because it's a hot issue and being lazy about it, not exercising due diligence in checking sources that we refer to, not exercising due diligence in making assumptions, on the fact that you do have black Iranians and Afro-Iranians in the community and then going and talking about race within the Iranian American community, never admitting that that assumption was a mistake. I spend my days admitting my mistakes. I, it's, it's something that if you want to bring change, especially social change, you must put your ego aside. There is no room for ego in activism, absolutely none. This is not about you, this is about those who are vulnerable. As a human rights attorney, when I go, and I, know, I don't just go there, I actually live in those places. For instance, I've lived in Nigeria for over a year as a um, child protection and emergency specialist working for the United Nations, spe specifically UNICEF, focusing on children fighting for Boko Haram, which is, hopefully you all know, a terrorist organization and an armed group that uses children. When you step into this kind of work, it's for ego. You don't have space to come and, and, and just make assumptions on the vulnerability of the people you're trying to serve or on the culpability of anyone. You must come neutral, independent, objective, bearing in mind that activism is, is not something that doesn't have any blueprints or any maps. Activism is also an expertise. And I think we're also seeing a lot of digital activism, which obviously is a positive, especially in places where voices are censored and where mainstream media necessarily cover and uh, you know, some, some of the crisis going on in the world. So we have digital citizens, right? We've seen it all over the world. We've seen how digital citizenship and how social media have enabled change and have been a positive impact in society. But unfortunately, we've also seen how it's also been performative and uh, a stage and a platform to maybe garner more attention on, our, on who we are and the work that we do. And in fine, 
ultimately not taking into account the people that we say we want to serve because that's truly what activism is. It's about serving. When you serve, your first thought has to be the beneficiary. And what is your specialty? If you're working on juvenile justice, who are on the receiving end of your activism, of your work? Is it you? No, it's incarcerated populations. So as you're working on this issue, your focus has to be these populations and not yourself. And when you quote sources or when you, when you host panels, it comes with responsibility of one, exercising due diligence, two, not exercising additional harm, three, ensuring peer review that's diverse before formulating opinions or hosting panels, and then quite frankly, my first advice is educate yourself with a critical lens. Educate yourself with a critical lens. Read books, but stay critical about what you're reading. Read articles, but stay critical about what you're reading. Ask yourself about what is and who is the POV of this person writing this book. Is that person representing the voice? It is also fine, but are they doing it in a way that respects the integrity and the authenticity of the populations that they're researching on or writing about? You'd be surprised. There are, are some writers who actually have integrity, neutrality, and impartiality as they're writing and researching on certain topics. Still exercise your critical thinking. You don't have to go to law school to, be called, uh, to become a critical thinker. You don't have to go to study philosophy or it is to be a critical thinker. Being a critical thinker is constantly questioning what you're being presented with and asking yourself the right questions. When it comes to blackness, constantly asking yourself, who is this POV coming from? What other POVs should be taken into account? POVs, point of views, you know, should be taken into account when, when, uh, when addressing the topic or a situation that these actions, even if it's just an Instagram, has an impact on people. It has an impact on, on everyone that sees it. It has an impact. It doesn't mean that it doesn't have impact. So I truly could go on in that, on, on that point. And to be quite frank, I th think what we're seeing right now, at the very least in the Iranian American diaspora, is that there is a willingness to discuss this topic. That wasn't the case 10 years ago. Now, what we need is to, as we're discussing issues of blackness or topic of blackness, because blackness is not just an issue, it's a beautiful thing, right? But issues of anti-blackness and topic of blackness uh, is not going to cause more harm that this erasure has caused and this erasure that's still ongoing. I think we must also, you know, talking to uh, but Tehran, Von Rasri, who's here, or myself, or the other Black and Afro Iranians, you have Black Iranians in Iran who have access to your content. You to your content, to your opinions that sometimes you may think are so wonderful and genius and intelligent, but maybe erase everyone, or maybe is making references to rape, hasn't even consulted the Black point of view before producing an opinion on Blackness, right? So, and in, in, that there isn't any Black Iranians and Afro-Iranians reading it says so much about the problem we're facing. The simple fact that we are not necessarily asking ourselves the Black Iranian, you know, woman sitting in Karaj, I'm being specific, who is watching, you know, or seeing what we're talking about, who's seeing this panel of this wonderful Iran 
discussing blackness, but gosh, I don't think I can actually spot any black person on that panel. You know, don't underestimate the people that you want to serve. Um, we're, we're actually very resilient. Black in the Iranian community is one of the hardest things, I believe, for me. Not just in the Iranian, the Iranian community, it's difficult to be black, period. It's difficult to be black in America. It's difficult to be black in the Iranian community. There is no reason why, as a community, we're somehow magically exempt from harming black people, from exercising implicit better. We're the same. We're flawed. We make mistakes. And again, if, if we don't face the problem, then we'll, we'll never change it. At least if we face it and agree that there is an erasure and not feel that that statement is revolutionary in itself because it truly isn't. I mean, open your eyes and be critical. Blackness in our community is non-existent in terms of representation. Pick up Shahnome, pick up uh, any of the of the of the Persian and tradition and 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 you know this this pride that we have, especially in uh, Tehran, Angeles, in Los Angeles, of being Persian, never takes into fooling ourselves if we're not admitting it. And if we're not facing that problem, then as James Baldwin said in himself, we're not going to change anything. And even as a reference, you know, as I'm using, I can already hear, you know, some iteration of Iranians and Iranian Americans thinking, this is such a westernized approach to our identity. Well, guess what? It's not. It's a black approach. Thank you to all of you. Snaps, I'm going to follow suit, Mana. Um, that was incredible. And I kind of want to follow up on the energy that Priscilla is giving us. Priscilla, you mentioned some ways that we can be better, um, be more effective accomplices rather than performative allies. You mentioned, you know, educating ourselves with a critical lens, removing egos, meeting our mistakes, following existing blueprints, doing due diligence, all of these things. I want to make sure that we are giving um, everyone on the panel a chance to also address the point that you brought up. Um, the question of, you know, what does it look like to each of you to be in solidarity with Black Lives Matter? And how can we each be more effective accomplices rather than performative allies? And of course, Priscilla, if you have more to add, I mean, I've listened to you talk all day, so please. Thank you. I wish my kids thought that too, but I'm working on it. <laughs> uh, you know, it's actually, it's interesting. I, I'd like to point out a couple of things that happened. Actually, since this is University of Maryland, uh, I'll point out things that actually specifically happened to me at the University of Maryland. I, I myself didn't attend uh, University of Maryland. I had a lot of friends that did, and it was like uh, a sister school to my schools, both, you know, when you're in the area, you have George Mason, you have GW, there's Georgetown. Uh, so you have these schools on this side and then University of Maryland on that side, which is an amazing school. There was a professor at University of Maryland that actually asked me to come speak to the class. And when I got a chance to speak to a class, they brought me in to speak about being mixed in the Iranian community and specifically being black, but being mixed myself. And it was one of those Iranian culture classes that a lot of Iranian kids take simply to get easy A's in school. And then there were some people who were not Iranian in the class, but very few, which is also a discussion that needs to be had. And then there were also, there were also students in the class who, who were mixed themselves. They were Iranian and Bolivian, Iranian and Guatemalan. There was an Iranian uh, and, and German. There were a brother and sister, Iranian and German. And there was an Iranian and Korean in the class. Now, when I was speaking, I spoke about these, these topics, the concept of, of race in the class. 
And one of the students, who's actually a very wonderful person, a very woke person, was like, that's not true. My family's not racist. Iranians aren't racist. You're just saying these things, making it up. And every mixed kid who was in the class was like, no. And, and there was a one, uh, there was one African-American student who was in a relationship with an Iranian girl who was also in the class. And every mixed kid in the class, when I said these things, they spoke up and they said, no, we've had the exact same experience. All of us. Now, we didn't get together and text each other before class and go, hey, let's make the, the Iranian people feel bad. Let's, let's make this up so that we, we start pointing fingers. We didn't do that, I assure you. Then the African-American uh, kid in the class, he spoke up and he's, he was speaking on how he was pre-med and how he was doing everything and how his, his girlfriend's parents never accepted him and how mean they were to him and how he's trying and he's learning. And I remember, remember listening to these things and it's something that I actually think about quite often, remembering how every single mixed kid and the one black kid in the, in the class had the same experience and an entire class of Iranians chose not to listen. Even the one who was the most woke amongst them, the person who I have seen at protests, the person who I've seen stand up for civil rights, the person that I've seen stand up for justice. And I remember that because it always stuck out in my mind. And the other experience that I had with the University of Maryland is there was a person at University of Maryland who actually spoke up one time and, and thought that it was very weird. I've been, I've been black and Persian uh, since the day I was born, but I've been black and Persian proud since I was in elementary school. I've always had a hat that said Tehran. I would put it in your face because I learned a very long time ago, my peace of mind would mean more to me than all of your comfort. And that being mixed was not something that was other. It was something that was me. And I enjoyed it. And, and I, and I enjoyed it. And it wasn't always so. Specifically, it happened when I was around four or five. I was in a, a kindergarten class and my father came to pick me up. My Iranian immigrant father with his mustache came to pick me up. And the teachers at my school could not understand how this Iranian man was my relative, let alone my father, because they'd only seen my mother pick me up. And they couldn't. And I remember my father and his Iranian boldness just pushing through, picking up picking me up in his arms and being like this is my son and walking away as you know basically to them he kidnapped me but the concept i learned that day was i just felt loved it didn't matter and i would be proud and my parents are both very iranian proud and african-american proud they are very proud of their cultures and their religious heritages and all of these things they're very proud and i learned that they are not mutually exclusive you can be you can be proud without having pride because pride is how you fall. You can be proud. I'm great and you're great too. And I've always taught self-love. Well, as in this journey of self-love, as I, I was a, a obnoxious, just uh, poignant, same person I am today with all the com confidence and ego in the world, which is why I'm not a human rights attorney. I remember there was a specific instance where a person at University of Maryland thought it was extremely weird and had a conversation on a chat, a forum that was forwarded to me on how I'm so weird because I think it's so special that I'm black and Iranian. Now, at the time, this person was the president of the Iranian Heritage Club. Well, I've always expressed like, I didn't get the benefit of having a black and Iranian Heritage Club. So I had to make my own, the same way Priscilla had to make her own because we don't get the, the award and privilege of having groups of people who can surround us and support us that are like us. We often have to look for it from platforms of privilege of people who do have the surroundings and we often have to find it there. You know how often I was told I'm not Iranian enough or I wasn't black enough or I wasn't Iranian enough or I wasn't black enough and it was defined. And here I've always learned that boxes are meant for things and not people. And I found in my life that I was always me enough, at least for me. And I was the perfect blend of black and Iranian, not because that's what you wanted me to be, but because that's what I chose to be, because that's who I am in my life. And, and I remember thinking to myself, it's so wonderful to see so many people participating in this, in this, in this chat right now. I think we have 51 participants, including the uh, four people and an organizer. So we have roughly 40 some people and it's amazing because most of you are not the problem. Most of you are also on board because you care. And if you're my friend, you care too. That's how it affects you the most. I, I remember thinking, wow, I wish, like I didn't expect it to be 50 people. 
but the best part would have been if it was 100 or 200 or the same amount of people that go to all these Persian parties and love being as pride and proud of being Persian would understand that this is part of the Persian identity as well and that we have a lot to, a lot to discuss and a lot to attribute as well. Actually, I didn't even listen to your question. What was your question again? It was something. You had a great question. I mean, was all you had a great question. The, the question specifically, and I think you did touch on it a little bit, um, it was, uh, what does it look like to you to be in solidarity with Black Lives Matter, and how can we be more effective accomplices rather than performative allies? Oh, yes, that's where I was getting. So the concept is Black Lives Matter to me, and, and I get this conversation, and the reason I brought this up is because I, I've seen so many Iranians, I've, I've, I've seen an overwhelming amount of support, and that's one thing that I do want to point out. And by overwhelming, do I think it's a majority? No, but I do think it's a, it is a loud minority that is under appreciate it and I, and I appreciate that it's there. And I would love to thank everyone even on this chat, uh, but I can't, I can't thank you for doing the right thing. This is what you're supposed to do, you're supposed to care. So, but I do appreciate it. I've been putting out videos in Farsi specifically so that it can uh, lead to this discussion. And, and, and the reason why Black Lives Matter is so important to me is because I am black and of course my children, uh, who I hope to have, I don't get to have three cute little ones like Vasilia, uh, but I hope to have, have children and, and they will also be black. But that's not the only reason why. I, I believe in it because I hear the pushback from the all lives matter when people say, but all lives matter, or even Iranians will use the hashtag Iranian lives matter, which they do if you mean it. However, if you're using it to be dismissive, then it's extremely disruptive and disrespectful. Uh, but why not all lives matter? And the concept is all, all didn't mean anything. All, all didn't include black when it was uh, all men are created equal. All did not include black when it was and justice for all. All did not include black in all those discussions. And that's why Black Lives Matter. That's why we have to distinguish. And clearly Black Lives Matter doesn't mean that all lives don't matter. It's sad that we have to remind people that Black Lives Matter in the first place. Thank you, Stefan. Yeah. Does anyone else wanna speak on that? I hope Priscilla speaks. Priscilla, I don't know why every time you say the most important things, your internet cuts out. I swear the federal investigators are listening in. They're like, oh, gotta blur that out. Gotta blur that you, out. But how do you know it's the most important then? Because it, it just sounds out. important. It just sounds important because you'll but come off it. <laughs> but you come out of it and you're like, and that's why. And I'm like, oh, what? what's why? What's why? That's exactly why I asked the only two. Um, I mean, it's, I think a lot has been said, you know, and, and um, again, I, I would ask again, you'll see, to ask the question. No problem. Um, what does it look said like now? <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to just say the question. No, 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 go ahead. What does it look like to you to be in solidarity with Black Lives Matter? How can we be more effective accomplices rather than performative allies? Which I know you spoke to um, a great deal already. But. Yeah, you know, what's, <clears throat> what I find very interesting when we say in solidarity with Black lives, you know, um, I'm not in solidarity. I, I, I support, obviously, anything that's, that's around it. Can you hear me? That's mute, what I mean. Unmute, I did, you were like, I'm not mute, in. Okay. Unmute. <laughs> okay. Shoot, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> so, no, I think it, it's interesting, you know, when we say Iranians for black lives or in solidarity, it's very important to be critical um, and, and, you know, every time constructively critical, you know, by that, by that I mean, because there is, um, there is the notion a Iranians for black lives that it's again something that's outside of the Iranian identity but it isn't um, like saying black Americans for black lives or you know it's 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 not something we would hear right if, if we agree if we agree that the posit is that blackness is a part of Iranian identity is a part of Iranian consciousness is a part of Iranian narratives the the way that they, um, it's, it's, you know, it's historical. I mentioned the, 
the Indian Ocean slave trade, but um, uh, uh, black people also migrate. You know, there were poor divers in, in the 19th century in the region, and uh, there is multicultural marriages. So there are many different ways that makes blackness a part of the Iranian identity. And that's why I always had an issue with mixed as a term, um, especially when it applies to to black uh, Iranians, because it, it almost implies that it is that foreign element of blackness um, that you know, makes you Iranian, that, that, that is a part of your Iranian identity, but is separate of your Iranian identity because you're mixed, right? So you're only black because your father is black and it's not the same as if, it, and, and you're just half Iranian and you know, maybe 30%, and I don't know what kind of mathematics people go through. We also have it in the, in far, Farsi, like Dorage, you know, it, it's, um, it's, it, these are problematic terms to me. I, I think you, you, when, you're, when you're born Iranian African or Iranian Congolese, or you're not, you know, 50 this and 40 this, uh, you, you, I mean, I lived in Congo, I live, I don't, when I'm in Congo, I'm not just 50% Congolese. And then in America, am I 0%? Like, how does that work? Because I wasn't born here. Like, you know, it's, it's, that's when we start realizing when we're critical about our language when we're critical about our ways of thinking even if it's a way of thinking that's been going for centuries doesn't make it right slavery has been going on for centuries it never made it right it never made it okay right racial discrimination is going on racial injustices have been going on these are human rights violations you know there's a principle of equality there is the the, the principle of non-discrimination that are all rights that are enshrined in, in all the conventions that you can think of, whether it's Geneva or the Convention on the Rights of the Child, it doesn't matter, it's all over. So to be half doing it almost when it comes to racial discrimination, racism, to be supposing that, but you know, as Tehran was saying, some people would say, you know, Iranian lives matter too. You're dismissing discrimination as a real, uh, a human right violation. And guess what? We, we really don't need everybody's opinion on it. It is enshrined in all the constitutions. Being racist is a human right violation. It's not just an opinion thing. I think Tehran mentioned that earlier, or I, was it Mona, I think? Your opinions. Uh, racism is real. It's as real as being enshrined in, in, in convention of human rights. It's as real as it gets. And we don't have to be sitting around tables and, you know, I'm experiences of actually being black in Iran and did you ever experience racism there and it's for me I'm going to be really straightforward it is an ignorant question because it presumes that there is no racism in the Iranian community and I would love to know how on earth it is possible that an entire community is exempt of something that the entire world is struggling with I'm answer because it's there is no such thing I, there is no need for us to sit and produce you know uh, stories of, of black suffering and pain and how many times we've been called this or called that for 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 someone to understand and and see that racism is an issue again read read you don't you just read the convention under uh, read conventions read articles watch documentaries but also maybe you should also have a diverse circle of friends who are also Afro-Iranians and Black Iranians as an, as an Iranian person, right? Um, Iranian Americans have obviously diverse circle of friends, especially younger generations. But how many Iranian Americans who identify brown or who are white passing actually have Black Iranian friends or Afro-Iranian friends? I mean, let's be real. Like how many times you've seen and heard people speak Farsi aside of Tehran. Miduni, it's just, it's a reality that we need to face. And it's, it's not okay to ask us to justify that racism exists. It's been there. Excuse me, there is a Persian Gulf slave trade. Hello. I mean, why do we need to talk about is racism a real thing or not? Haji Firuz was a, a name, a common name given to enslaved East African by Persian slaveholders. There were many Haji Firuz in Rajar courts. There were many Hajifirus 
and they were trafficked, enslaved, brought into Iran at the time, Persia, and there were minstrels. There were minstrels for the Raja kings. Again, read the history of the world didn't, for some magical reason, just, you know, when it comes to racism, decided to skip the Persian Empire. The Persian Empire, one of the biggest empires with the Ottoman Empire at the time. So it, it, at some point, we also have to realize the questions that we're asking, why we're asking them. Are we asking that question? Because we're not so convinced that there is racism in our community. And if that's why you're asking that question, again, read with a critical lens. Enlarge your circle of friends. Make it more diverse. Not just like having a Black American friend or, you know, a Sudanese friend, which is all great. But make sure that within your community, you also do have Black Iranians, Afro-Iranians, and I'm not saying go run for us, obviously, but be mindful of the fact that we are here, right? Be mindful of the fact that we exist and of the fact that ignoring that we are here harms. I don't even know if I answered the question, but I think at this point. You did, and it was not only a great answer, I just want to add a little thing to what Priscilla was saying. Um, also, arrest the cops that killed Breonna Taylor. Uh, I, go ahead. I was just going to ask if you had anything to add about um, the question which I can repeat if you want. Yeah, no, I wrote it down. Um, and I also had two amazing panelists who just spoke and I think they said everything. Um, I think one thing to know, and so this has come up a couple of times that some Iranians have said, or some Iranian Americans have said, you know, um, well, why, would, why should I show up for black lives? There's, you know, like Iranians that are harmed or killed or suffering right now in Iran and no one speaks about them. And it's interesting for me, cause it's like saying, hey, I expect someone from this country that I live in who doesn't live in Iran to show up for people there. I live here and I refuse to show up for people in the same country I live in. So I think that's part of it. I think um, showing up for black lives means like taking the leadership of the movement for black lives and showing up in the ways that are asked of you. It doesn't mean that we need to recreate an organization here. It doesn't mean we need to have things like Iranians for black lives. We should just be showing up for m for bl We should be showing up both on a national level and also on a local level. What are the groups in your, in your city, in your state, like BYP 100, BLM DC, like whatever it is, show up for those folks and show up. And it doesn't have to be in a really loud way. It doesn't have to be with like sharing social media. It's about donating, putting your body on the line, showing up at the protest, uh, offering your services if you have um, if you're a lawyer, if you're a doctor, like whatever it is, whatever skills you have, whatever resources you have, whatever it is, even if it's time sharing that. If you do start saying things like um, Iranians for Black Lives and like trying to kind of um, separate in that way, then what you're basically doing is you're centering yourself. You're centering yourself as a non-Black person and saying, I need to be centered in this work for showing up. I need to like get the kudos or the accolades. The only reason we should ever in any point like separate in that way is because we're working on the the issues of black Iranians within our own community. So if we're talking about Iranians, non-black non Iranians for black lives, which in itself is a really strange thing. My relationship with Priscilla started uh, because a group of alumni from EOB created a guide, a, a guide on Instagram called Iranians for Black Lives. And there were so many of them at the time. The last two months has been nothing but messiness from our community for that is that the expectation is so low, the bar is so low, we've centered the people that are racist, that are openly anti-Black. And these are, you know, like in our community um, and it, within the Iranian diaspora and within Iran, there's so many identities that are marginalized and excluded on a regular basis, whether it's like the Kurds and the Baluchis and all of those um, various groups, or it's like Baha'is and we're talking about religion, or it's like socioeconomic and we're forgetting that there's a ton of people that are not rich and don't fit into that very narrow definition 
definition. And I told my mom and I told my, my parents' generation all the time, I'm like, you all want to keep defining it in such a narrow way where at the end, nobody's going to be left. None of us are going to want to be a part of that community. And you wonder why your community center has no young people. And you wonder why, you know, you say it's that I don't want to be Iranian. It's not that I don't want to be Iranian. It's that Iranians don't want me to be in the community with them. And so that was my struggle as like someone who didn't really fit those definitions as a young person. A couple months ago, um, a group of my alumni from EOB created this, this um, like Instagram post and um, Priscilla reached out and she was like, yo, this literally, she would never say that, but she, she in her very articulate <laughs> human rights attorney way, broke it down so beautifully. She said, yo, she says, yo, I want to clear this air. She has said, yo, I have heard her <laughs> say, yo. <laughs> but she she basically she broke it down and was like did you not think any black Iranians were going to be looking at this like did you just forget we exist and here are all the things that are wrong with this and our relationship started from a really um difficult conversation and a lot of labor on Priscilla and from there I was like you're right I'm gonna admit all of that take ownership for that fix that be responsible and I'm just gonna be quiet and listen and learn and in the last few months um, I've been in different ways trying to like uh, not only learn and grow more as a person but also try to take the kind of access and power I have within the community to talk to other spaces because what happened was there was messiness for like the last two months where everybody was like I'm gonna show up for the first time now or like I think I'm good it's because the bar was so low that if you just had like the good politics you also felt like you were a leader and we needed to all hear your hot take and so there was like so many panels that were organized where like there was maybe one black Iranian voice if there even was or there was and sometimes the black Iranian that they had on the panel was a person who did not have experience being black and Iranian and I saw these names and I thought it was very interesting it's a person who either was raised completely black but just happened to be uh half Iranian and we have examples of that the most famous of course is TJ Hushmanzadeh and everyone loves like uh, Yara, who's like a sister to me. So anyone knows Yara is like my sister, but she doesn't have as much uh, experience being black and Iranian. She's also learning. She wasn't raised in it as completely as someone, for, for example, I would have to, if it came to a conversation about being black and Iranian in Iran, I wouldn't speak on it, Priscilla would. There are people with different experiences and different level experiences. Just stop finding the uh, the, the form of a Iranian Candace Owens and being like, well, they can speak for everyone. That is not how it works, especially if they've never spoken on this subject before. You have, you have people with PhDs and degrees and academic understanding and documentaries that they're putting out and books that they've written and books that they've read, like Priscilla, who can enlighten us on these subjects. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, no, that was great. And absolutely, I think, um... Also what happened was, you know, there were folks that organized these where if, if, if you're struggling to find someone to speak, then you're struggling to find a token, you shouldn't be organizing that panel in the first place. You shouldn't be organizing that at all. You should be, if your organization or your space has an issue, which we all, all spaces do with anti-blackness, you shouldn't be trying to become the voice um, and, and trying to organize that. You should actually go internally, focus on what you need to change within your organization, your space, your community, do the internal work and in every single individual needs to do internal work because our proximity to trauma is so close like we either have direct trauma family trauma generational trauma and that's just the reflection of that's the reality of being Iranian right and being part of um, and being Iranian American in particular and being between these two countries in this history so you got to do the internal work uh, Priscilla you know mentioned it's like look at the biases acknowledge them acknowledge your privileges acknowledge those things work on that and focus on that that doesn't then become an excuse to not show up for Black Lives and to not take the leadership of the movement for Black Lives and do what we need to do. But if you're going to acknowledge in some way your Iranianness, then you have to acknowledge the anti-Blackness that we all need to be working on. And I think that the best thing is like taking our cue from folks who are doing the organizing and doing the leading and not taking up so much space. We should be we should be seeing you know my co-panelists on like all the panels that we should be seeing more voices. Um, when I was gonna even like be on this panel, I like checked in with Priscilla and I was like, I'm not black, should I even be a part of this? And even to this moment, I'm not sure if I made the right decision to even be a part of this panel. It would be beautiful to have a panel about this that's only black Iranians leading it and, and actually speaking. Yossi's 
you know, got her history with um, UMD and UC the president that. So, so it makes sense student group asked, I'm not really sure if I should even have been a part of this, but if I am going to be a part of this, I'm going to try to model what it looks like, which is like, we all just need to shut up and get out of the way is the reality of it. And we need to go back to our own families and our own communities and our own spaces and work on that and stop giving ourselves pats on the back for thinking we showed up and we did so much because the bar is so low in the community. There's, we're, as a community, we have so much we have to continue to do. And it's not just us. Like I have a lot of other organizer and activist friends from other diaspora communities who are organizing Instagram lives and having panels and they're completely forgetting that there are black Koreans and they're like black Filipinos and they're, you know, and like everyone's having this moment where they want to talk about this, but we all just need to be quiet. So that's what I'm gonna do now too. I think, I think your voice is extremely necessary and I appreciate all the work that you do. So as a black Iranian, I will attest to you and only a, only a necessary uh, part of this panel, you are a great contributor. But I do agree with the fact that we do have people in our community such as Priscilla, such as myself, and such as many others. And in fact, the fact that people think black Iranians are so rare. The truth is then you just don't realize that many black Iranians do not want to deal with the black, uh, with the Iranian community. It's easier to just be black because black people in this regard can be less judgmental than Iranians can be. It's easier to just be black. I know people always uh, assume, uh, sure, because I capitalized on this concept. However, I wasn't the only black and Iranian. Uh, people, I remember one time I had a conversation with, with someone who was like, well, you're only known because you're black and Iranian. I was like, am I the only black and Iranian you know? They were like, no. And I was like, who? Oh. She's like, well, my cousins are black and Iranian. I was like, what do they do? And she's like, well, one's a teacher and one works at a, at a, at a Target. And I was like, they're not famous? And she said, no. And I was like, well, I guess I'm not just famous just because I'm black and Iranian. Then that's not the only concept. There was a little more to it. And, and people don't realize even those comments are passively, passive aggressively racist. Uh, or when a, a grandmother comes up to me, is like, Tehran, to chat khosh, tipi was a seal boost. You're so cute for a black guy. That's passive aggressively racist. Now, I allow grandmas a little more leeway because after 80 years, Mamani gets a lot more uh, leeway when it comes to it. But I still oftentimes find myself in my own way putting people in check and expressing when people say things, this is one of my biggest pet peeves, by the way, Ted on Farsi so that one for my cousin, my friend, my, you know, for whoever. And it's like, I'm not a dog. I'm not a pet. I've never invited an Iranian over to my American friends and been like, yo, speak English, speak English for them. They, they won't believe you speak English. You don't look like you speak English. It, it's a lot of passive aggressive, uh, microaggressions that go on. And those are bigger. It's easy to see the N word. It's less, less easy or less comfortable to speak about simple things as calling a black person Badim June, right? It's less, it's, it, it's it, what? It's just an eggplant. Yeah, but you know what you meant. It's dismissive. And it's like any internalized relationship. When you're in a relationship and anyone who on this panel has been in a relationship and been in a situation where someone brings an issue up to you and it's like, hey, I have an issue. Like if you're dating a girl and she's like, hey, I think this is a problem. And you're like, whatever, it's not even a problem. It's not even that big a deal. You're, you're crazy. Dismissing them never ever solves the problem. I just want to let everyone on this panel know, any uh, heterosexual males know that dismissing your significant other uh, is never the solution. And then when they get upset about it going, oh my God, just relax, relax. That'll never work either. Well, that's what society is doing to a majority of the black voice, which is, hey guys, we have a problem. Oh, you guys again? Ah, oh, what is it this time? Well, oh, slavery so long time ago. What do you mean? And then people getting upset by that and then saying, relax, why can't you just relax? You're so dramatic. And that's what fuels the fire. So be aware of that, whether it's on a microaggression level or a macro level. It's small things are indicative of much larger things. And it all starts with you. Beautifully said, thank you. 
I want to acknowledge that we are a couple minutes over. This has really just like flown by because it's just been like constant, like I have to write this down. I have to write this down. It's so good. Um, I do want to make sure that we are being mindful of all of our wonderful panelists time because they've already taken so much time to go through all of this with us. So I just want to ask them, um, well, one, I hope that, you know, people who are watching feel like their questions were somewhat answered by what we covered already. And so I just want to ask our panelists for any closing remarks, thoughts to leave us with, anything they want to plug. Um, now would be the space. I just, I just read um, on the chat, on the Q&A, um, like the audience questions. I mean, uh, th there is a question I saw about, um, what was it, if it's okay, do you think it is even more difficult being African-American and Iranian as opposed to just being African-American? You know, is, um, we need to stop with questions like this. You know, it it's not a, a competition of which one is worse or which, which one is better. It's, it's, or which one as an experience is more difficult or as an experience is less difficult. The, the, the focus is not on the degree of, of the difficulty, you know, of the experience. The focus should simply be on, on, on the fact that if there is such a thing as a black Iranian experience, then it means that, you know, there is, there are, there is a situation that needs to be addressed. There is a conversation that needs to be had. And, 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 and the posit is not so much interesting in its comparison. You know, you, 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 it's, it's, uh, there's no value really truly in comparing. The di they're different cultures, they're different communities, they're different realities, they're, they're different many things. The most important is, um, I believe, to focus that we embrace the diversity of our identity, including the Black identity within the Iranian identity. And yes, there is a lot of anti-Blackness in our community. There is also a lot of beautiful things in our community. But if we don't address the anti-Blackness, whether it is better or worse or mild or is irrelevant is, is the simple fact that there is anti-blackness present in our community should suffice so that we address it and maybe also what's what's important and essential to bear in mind is that there is blackness in our community and it is a part of the iranian identity not something that's outside of the iranian identity and once we accept that and realize that oh wait Everything's fine, actually. There is blackness in the Iranian identity. There are Afro-Iranians. Okay, that's actually interesting. Look at all this diversity. There is a whole world that start, start opening. There is so much more discovery. I mean, I'm learning so much from, from, from my country, Iran. I'm learning so much, so much from, from Congo. I'm learning so much from America. And I think if we all start from the positive that we want to learn, as open as you can, you know, I know, I don't know much about the Bakhtiari. I know a little more about the Lord. I know a little more about, you know, it's, it's, but then I want to read more about the Bakhtiari. I want, you know, it's, it's information that's there. As long as you are committed in, 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 in learning about the diversity of our culture, instead of questioning its diversity or ignoring its diversity, being a part of the either intentional erasure of it or unintentional erasure of it which at the end of the day has the same result which is erasure uh, it, you know is the um, is the story that being iranian also looks like me also looks like tehran also looks like alex who's a co-founder of the collective and he's afro-iranian from obodon his mom is afro-iranian born and raised in iran way more than probably all of these people who are attending this panel, right? Because she has lived all her life and she is a black woman. She's, you know, she is an Afro-Iranian and, 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 and his father is Iranian. And by that, he's, there is no foreignness that comes with blackness. Blackness is present everywhere in all communities. And I truly think it's the starting point. Stop seeing yourselves as a community that has no blackness within it or that when it does have blackness, it only comes from outside. It is present within, 
our community, it has been, and it will always be. And once we free, acknowledge that reality, the same way it's present in French communities, the same way it's present in Japanese communities, the same way it's present in Palestinian communities, we have Afro-Palestinians, we have Black Palestinians, the same way it's present in Lebanese communities, everywhere, absolutely everywhere. And that presence, exists within societies, which means people who live in those societies interact with black Palestinians, with black Iranians, with such and such in Iran. And that, that interaction sometimes, you know, is, is anti-black and sometimes is celebratory. I mean, I still, honestly, I wouldn't go that fast for the celebratory part. I think we're, we have a lot until we get there. It isn't, I've never experienced it as a celebratory thing. I'm just gonna be real. But um, this is what we aim for, you know, with the collective, is aiming, the collective for Black Iranians is truly aiming that we embrace our diversity when it comes to the Black Iranian and Afro-Iranian identity and realizing that we are way more eclectic, we are way more diverse than we think as Iranian people. You have the North, you have the East, you have the West, the Center, the South. And then if you take it to the diaspora, there's no limits, not even the sky. So stop seeing being Iranian if it's different for what we've been fed or our lives for it to be something outside, external. And this until, you know, it is properly, it is properly integrated in our minds because that's the first step of harm is ignoring and erasing the presence of That's how you know whatever she was about to say was really important. Did you see? Whatever she was about to say right there was the most important thing in the entire thing. Priscilla Buzz, lost. Oh, eventually. Uh, Go ahead. Oh, no. Buzz Vegu. Priscilla Vegu. The last sentence I think we missed. I forgot the last sentence. You I know, think but it's it time was. We'll have real panel. No, 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 no. I don't want to be uh, social <laughs> distance. Social Spotty. distance. But I. We'll do six feet, but um, I'm not actually, yeah, but yeah, it's, it's a joke. But yes, I mean, my point was just to accept that it's Iranian identity, but within the Iranian identity. Is it still cutting as I'm talking? No, 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 we, that was, we, for we don't even need it? a third of that sentence. We understood, we understood. Um, I, I do wanna, I, I wanna, of course, acknowledge hopefully we have more of these panels actually and we have these panels and they're ongoing and we have panels on different issues in the iranian community and we hit that panel from racism we go to sexism because if you look uh you see three powerful intelligent iranian women leading this panel and one amazing iranian woman who was uh, who helped organize it and responsible for organizing it and that's what we see with a lot of movements when it comes from Iran is that it's the women truly lead the way. And I, I think that needs to be something that's acknowledged uh, specifically. As for, uh, I saw a question that came across where a person asked, do you think it is even more difficult being African American and Iranian as opposed to just being African American? And that is a question which seems like it has an easy answer, but it doesn't. And I'm always under the uh, influence of educate, not humiliate. And the concept is, it's difficult to be other, it's difficult to be more other than other. So anytime you add different uh, dynamics to it, it's difficult, but in different ways. Being African American is a difficult concept, it's extremely unique. It's, uh, America can be so racist that oftentimes when people are protesting racism, people feel like People are protesting America itself. And that's how much racism is a part of America and American society. And that's a bigger problem than we realize. So being Iranian and African-American creates its own duplicity because of the dynamic of, of, of intersectionality within your own cultures and being at home where you have the concept of Iranians and Americans who are now racist towards you and then you're not enough of one thing. So black Americans can be uh, prejudicial towards you. Iranians can be biased towards you. And there can be bigotry, of course, from uh, 
the majority white America. So it does make it much more difficult creating that, finding that identity. Anytime Iranians have something to say and they bring up the concept, well, well, we're Persian and Persians have done this and Persians have done that. And every single time they throw out the term 5,000 years, I, I, I want to express something very, very heavy, which is the concept is we oftentimes lean on a culture without correcting it, which is something we should be aware of. But also when we place ourselves in other people's shoes, which many Iranians do, well, we came here with no, no language and we were able to be successful. How come black people, for example, were not able to do so? You don't just walk a mile in someone else's shoes. You walk with their, with their shoes and their feet and their legs and their knowledge and ability of how to walk and then see how far you get. So when Iranians look at themselves and say, well, we came here and we became successful, sure, because most of the times the most successful of you are the ones who endured and, and therefore succeeded uh, in the diaspora. It's people who may not have had money, but they had education. They were businessmen or doctors or lawyers in their home country, or they did come from a lot of money and you can't take that away. And we're able to succeed and survive. But in Iran itself, you see that that's not always the case. And to Priscilla's point, I often have to find myself telling people, Iran, Farad, Tehran, Nice. Iran is not just the city of Tehran. There are many different places in Iran with many different cultures. And when we make jokes about Turkish people and their accents and Armenian people and their accents or whatever we do, and we're, we're dividing. And that's actually the antithesis of the strength, which is Iran. Iran's greatest strength has been the diversity in its nationalities. That is why there is still an Iran. That is why when you ask these great empires of, of, of the past, whether it's the, the Egyptian or the Babylonian or the Phoenician, who are now the Lebanese and, and, and the Syrians and the Iraqis, and you ask the and you and the Egyptians, of course, and you ask them what are they? They all say Arab. Well, why does Iran not say it's Arab? Why Iran, who was also invaded, does not have this affinity towards that culture? It's specifically because we had a Hafez. It's specifically because we had a Ferdowsi. It's specifically because we embraced diversity because of a King Cyrus. We embraced diversity that people felt that they were all Iranian because they are. Iran is not its government, it is, and it has always been its people. And that's the concept of today, is that when you take one idea and you take one candle, you light it, you light another candle, now you have two candles. With two candles, you can light two more, and now you have four. Four becomes eight, eight becomes 16, 16, 32. And then one day you realize that an entire nation is aflame with an ideology. The ideologies of justice, equality, and diversity, inclusivity, the ideology of justice for all and truly what it means. That's what we're looking for. In Farsi, there's the saying, which means simply a person who's asleep can be woken up, but a person who pretends to sleep, a person who pretends to be asleep will never be woken. So all I ask of all of you is stay woke. Thank you, Tehran. I feel like I'm going to need that Zarbal Masa one more time so I can really internalize it. Do you mind saying it again? I got you. Kesi ke khab has, mi she bidar kar. Bali kesi ke khodesho mi zane be khab, hich vakht bidar nemi she. Love that. I'm a big fan of Zarbal Masa, so that's like right up my alley. Thank you so much, Tehran. Mana? Yeah, I think... Um... I said the part about how it's important to do internal work. I think there was a question about the, from anonymous attendee I wanted to kind of acknowledge. Um, because I built a youth space and I, I organized youth camps, um, one of the things I think we have to be really mindful of is folks don't want to have to fight just to be a part of a space and have their existence be able to be in that space. So what I'm saying is like, ways you can do this to be really helpful is 
go ahead and start building the spaces you're a part of to include everyone, even the people don't, who don't already exist in that space. Don't make it so that it's a pressure and responsibility of the first person who comes in with a different identity to be able to become part of that space has to like deal with that, right? So like using language that allows for trans identities, non-binary identities, like all those, you know, like that's an example. Or like when we talk about it in Iranian spaces, it's like not being such a narrow definition and allowing people to actually be able to exist and I think part of it is like we get stuck on the rudarvasi and the politeness um, as part of our culture uh, I think it's really important that and I've talked to my mom about this who like thinks sometimes I'm a little too blunt or a little too rude and I'm like yo I'm Iranian American like uh, it's important for me to take my core values and so I think one of my core values is to be really compassionate and so acknowledging that the proximity to trauma and all the difficulties that people have and just being a part of our identities and our communities and with our history and at the same time upholding the values and not prioritizing or centering the people who are part of the problem not not allowing the discomfort of them to be prioritized over the inclusion of other folks right and ensuring that everyone's included and no one's being erased by it and first acknowledging whenever you're a part of something being like why why is it going that way like who am i leaving out of the room who am i leaving out of the conversation why do i need to center myself because all of us have to do that internal work and have to acknowledge in that way and i think um you know, it's taking the direction of people who are organizers and who are leaders and who do the work. So I've learned a lot from Priscilla. I'm learning so much just listening to Tehran in this space. Um, I don't need to organize my own space. You know, I can just join other folks' spaces. And so I think anything, it, it comes back to ego too. So being really mindful of what Priscilla said earlier, is it our ego that's pushing us for this? Um, there's a lot that's happening right now and i think that what we can do is start with looking at your own families your own friends your own groups and having those conversations and doing them in ways that are compassionate and doing them in ways that are actually going to be effective and not just make you feel like you're in the right but that you're actually having the conversations that are going to move those folks right so when like my friends that are um from white families that have a lot of issues around racism and they have Republicans and they tell me like, oh yeah, I stopped going the holidays with them. I'm like, I, they're never gonna listen to me talk about these issues. They're only gonna listen to you. You are not only forfeiting that space, you're trying to take up space in my space all of a sudden because my space is safe enough for you. I think the same thing is, the, is true for non-Black Iranians in Iranian spaces. It's not okay to think that you can say whatever you say or do whatever you do because you listen to a certain type of music or you like to dress a certain way. If you are profiting off of the bodies of Black people, you better be supporting them, you better be putting the money and that's and that's true because we have designers in our community who do we have performers we have all sorts of folk who are not black and who constantly in different ways profit off of that right so i think that that's important to also acknowledge and work on and then the last thing is we are a hyper capitalistic culture we have so much of it it permeates in everything and that's what the first question is like why are we focusing on having people become doctors and lawyers and all that and i acknowledge that part of it is because our parents uh, and some of our families lost their privileges when they came to this country because their careers were not careers that translated easily here, right? But also the like combination of that uh, model minority, like hyper capitalistic Iranianness with like the American dream is just going to become this really toxic, perfect storm. So I think it's important for us to also acknowledge that. And then lastly, um, know that whenever you speak about something, you're speaking from a place of your own experience. I did not grow up in Iran. I did not live in Iran. Everything I talk about is within the Iranian diaspora contest specifically um, within the American context, even though I have family in other parts. I think that's just important to acknowledge and to know that when I talk about that in that narrow definition, I can't generalize that for everyone. I can't assume that my family values turned into our community values turn into an entire experience of people. And so if you know that, then you know you're always taking, talking from your own place and your own experience, then you're allowing to have the space and experiences of other people exist in there too. That's, that's all I would say. And I think that that's really important. And I'm glad I was on this panel with y'all because I learned so much. And thank you to the attendees who stuck around with us uh, through all of this. Um, and thank you for ISF and Yossi for organizing it. Priscilla Tehran, um, 
y'all are fantastic. Let me know how I can show up and continue to show up. I'm, I'm just grateful to be learning from y'all. Thank you so much, Mana. I mean, everything you all have said tonight has just been phenomenal. And I can't thank each of you enough for taking so much time, staying extra to walk us through what y'all have been experiencing your whole lives. Um, and I know that's not easy. So thank you all so much for being here. Thank you to all the panelists. Thank you to ISF. Um, yeah, I think that's a wrap. <laughs> no, I just want to say thank you so much for having us. And, you know, on these, since Yasi likes the Zabu Masab, let's hit a Shah Bait. Shah Bait, one that reminds me of right now is uh, uh, from Hafez, actually. Yari and dar kas nemi binamo, yaran ro cheshod, dusti keo haroma, dustaran ro cheshod. And when I look at this panel, that's when I see yaran, that's when I see yari, that's when I see dustaran, that's when I see dustari. And I, I appreciate everyone for taking their time because there are things that we can do. And, and those, those ideas are so simple. Have this conversation and keep it going. I know it's uncomfortable. Keep that conversation going. Try to have or go out of your way to make sure that there are people of color in the conversation when you do. Educate yourself, take that time. It's not the responsibility of black people to educate you on the history of racism. Take the time that you use to watch 13 Reasons Why and watch the documentary 13th. Do the same thing, educate yourself. Take a second and sign these petitions. Um, because basically, if this was about dolphins, everyone would have signed it. If they were about straws and turtles, everyone would have signed it. Make sure your voice is heard. You do all have platforms of privilege. And even though I do realize that you are all at times also racially identified and oppressed, just know that comparison is the, uh, is the thief of compassion. So don't let it take away the compassion you have for someone else. Don't say, but what have they done for me? Think about it is what can we do for us? Because it's not us versus them or black versus white. It's good people versus bad people. More importantly, it's good people versus bad ideology. So make your voice heard. And if you can donate your time, energy, and it's not Black Lives Matter, it's NAACP. If not, it's Equal Justice Initiative. It's the Thurgood Marshall College Fund. Show up at a protest but do not avoid the discomfort and uncomfortableness of your feelings of those of of those around you we can control this we can stop this especially when it comes to systemic racism it's something that's within our grasp individual racism is a throwback to anthropological uh, genealogy and tribalism systemic racism are words their laws, their regulations, their behaviors that don't hold each other accountable. And accountability will often feel like an attack if we're not ready to accept responsibility. So I think it's just time we all accept responsibility. And if you think there are no racists in Iran, just ask the Afghan people how they feel about that. And you'll see how quickly racism is so very real. Thank you, Tehran. Well, I guess it's time to go. All right, guys, it's been fun. Thank you, UMD, Priscilla, Mana, Yasi, Yasna, everybody in the chat. I appreciate you. Uh, no, thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. That was great. Hopefully, we'll have many out there. There was a lot of questions about what to do with our parents, with our grandparents. Maybe I just want to say to finish that, you know, our parents, including my own mother, and our grandparents were not taught about the Persian Gulf slave trade or the Indian Ocean slave trade or the presence of Afro-Iranians in, in, in Iran. They were not taught this in school and people in Iran are still not taught on. There is um, a, an absence of knowledge when it comes to, you know, even the presence and all that. So when you are faced with, you know, racist comments, of whether, you know, they're, target it towards a friend or towards someone you don't know, a complete stranger, don't be afraid of speaking up. There is ignorance within our community, just like there is ignorance in other communities. And that's okay. We must speak up. Violence has never helped any causes. But if you don't manage to speak up, it is also okay. Just continue asking yourself how within my 
community, I better. How within my community, I can educate, I can share, and I can mobilize. And as long as you continue asking yourselves the question of how and why and what and with who, we will be fine and we will be even, you know, hopefully in our lifetime, embracing a community that is celebrating its diversity, including its beautiful black identity in the Iranian yeah. community. So. Oh, no. Yeah. Yo, it's been fun. Guys, I have to go for it uh, for a show. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Free everyone. Free city, boss. Free city. Chai goes there. Chai goes there. Chai goes there. Bye, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>